Welcome. Thanks for joining the session. My name is David Stout. I'm a developer evangelist with Cisco DevNet. Um, I've been working uh, with developers and Cisco uh, collaboration technologies and APIs uh, for the better part of uh, 15 years, 16 years now, uh, perhaps too long. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I've seen a lot of uh, collaboration technology, worked with a lot of developers, um, and uh, really excited uh, about the direction of, uh, that Spark has taken. A uh, lot of uh, focus from Cisco and uh, all the collaboration engineering teams um, are uh, hard at work on making Spark uh, a really excellent platform, uh, not only for, for customers, uh, but for de developers as well. Uh, one of the key differentiators with Spark uh, as a platform for developers and, and uh, for customer use is security um, and the control of uh, you know, licensing, user access, uh, how applications uh, get access to data within the system, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's an important topic. Uh, it's not necessarily the sexiest one. Um, uh, you can't really talk about authentication and Spark boards uh, in quite the same breath, but it is important. Um, if you're considering developing applications, we'll talk a little bit about the approaches that you might take uh, when integrating with Spark, uh, especially in uh, respect to security and authentication um, and uh, how that works out in practice. Uh, the good news is that uh, number one, Spark uh, APIs uh, and, and application access are designed to uh, continue uh, the extended end-to-end uh, -end encryption model for Cisco Spark. Uh, so all the applications connect securely with the latest, uh, you know, encryption uh, uh, codex. Um, all data is uh, encrypted uh, using the keys, just like the regular client stuff. Um, <clears throat> there are a few exceptions to that when you're uh, getting getting messages uh, that we'll talk about very briefly. Um, <clears throat> but the uh, the other good piece of the news is that it's uh, actually pretty easy to deal with. Um, if you are familiar with at all with OAuth and SAML and SSO. Uh, it's kind of a big spaghetti mess of, of acronyms and configurations and different vendors uh, trying to work together. Um, I think the Spark team has done a, a great job of making that work out, uh, making it very easy for developers to do the right thing as far as uh, secure connections and working with SSO and uh, OAuth uh, as well. <clears throat> so let's uh, jump right in and see what we're going to talk about today. Uh, just briefly talk about the different kinds of uh, developer access tokens, bot tokens, OAuth tokens. Uh, so how does an application, you know, not just a user, but how does an application authenticate with the Spark service? Um, and depending on which mechanism they use to do that, what can they do? What can't they do? What does it look like? What kinds of solutions are uh, consistent with using that kind of authentication mechanism? Some are easy to use, some are not as easy to use, uh, but again, not too, not too bad. We'll take uh, a little bit of a deep, deep dive into uh, OAuth 2, SAML, all that good stuff, single sign-on, and see how that works uh, in practice here. Um, we have uh, some good sample code, some good sample applications and learning labs that can walk you through that. Um, I, I think, frankly, it's one of the easier uh, OAuth 2 implementations that I'm aware of, so good news if you're developing applications uh, for your end users to, to take a look at. <clears throat> so the, <clears throat> the main reference and uh, kind of hub for Cisco Spark developers is, of course, uh, developer.ciscospark.com. Uh, all the information, or mostly, I think all the information that we're going to talk about here today uh, can be found essentially on here. Um, it's, uh, it does a great job of, of explaining it simply yet thoroughly, I think. Uh, has some really cool interactive uh, documentation um, that uh, lets you test the APIs uh, right in the browser that we're going to show you here in a second. Um, uh, really a big fan of this developer portal, and uh, a lot of developers like it. <clears throat> so uh, if you are familiar at all with Spark and, uh, and are familiar at all with APIs, um, the idea is essentially, uh, for now anyway, uh, focused on Spark messaging uh, so that applications can automate essentially everything to do with Spark messages. Uh, apps can create teams, they can create rooms, they can put people in rooms, they can take people out of rooms, uh, they can send messages, they can receive messages um, <coughs> via Spark webhooks. Um, it's all about message control and interaction being driven by applications. <coughs> 
The developer site that I talked about has a nice API reference um, where you can take a look in detail at the different API capabilities. Uh, for example, you can uh, interact with people, you can interact with rooms, for example, to list rooms, uh, list all the rooms that a particular user has access to, create new rooms, etc. <clears throat> the Cisco Spark API is RESTful, so it uses HTTPS web requests using the uh, verbs and, and paradigms of the web, so get requests and posts and put. Um, very easy to consume, very easy to use in virtually any development environment on just about any platform. <clears throat> and uh, we, we even provide uh, native SDKs for Java and NodeScript if that isn't easy enough for you. The key to using uh, any API call, for example, here we want to get a list, just a big list of rooms uh, that be belong, for example, to my account, is this access token. Right? <clears throat> so instead of a username or password, uh, all Spark authentication is based on access tokens. Right? So if we take a look at one, uh, it's a really long, you know, unique string of letters and numbers um, that actually references quite a few things. It, it re references an individual user, so me or you, or maybe a bot account, <laughs> or maybe somebody else, an admin user, for example. It also represents a set of permissions. Uh, so by using this API token, an application may have a limited set of permissions. Maybe they can only read uh, messages from a room. They're not allowed to post anything into a room, for example. Um, the uh, access tokens, uh, some of them do expire. Uh, so applications may need to be aware of that and know how to refresh uh, access tokens or get new ones or prompt the user to reauthenticate. Um, but it's all about the tokens when you're making API request calls. And we'll take a look at that, how that works in a second. <clears throat> there are th three primary access tokens that, as a developer, you'll uh, end up uh, messing with. Uh, the first one is uh, what I call a developer access token, but it's just a user access token. Uh, essentially, any user on Spark uh, can go to the developer.ciscospark.com page and grab their token. They can go into the interactive documentation, start making API calls, creating rooms, sending messages through that inter interactive doc uh, just by grabbing that token. So that makes it really easy to explore uh, what the API can do, to get, get a feel for how it works. Um, it lasts for a while, but not eternally. And we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, later. Uh, it's important to note that if you do anything with the Spark API using this developer token, it looks like you did it. So if you go into a room and uh, if you use the API to post a message to a room, it'll say, you know, David Stout, you know, in the message. And so it looks like it's, it's working on behalf of you as a user. The other kind of access token that's very commonly used by applications is what we call a bot. <clears throat> so a bot is like a machine account. It's um, a service account. Uh, it doesn't, it's not supposed to represent a regular Spark user, but rather some sort of service or application. Uh, so it's a slightly different concept than uh, a chat, an interactive chat bot, um, but uh, very often interactive chat bots uh, will use a bot token to implement their integration with Spark. <clears throat> so when you use API requests using a bot token, it looks like the bot did it, right? So we'll see here in a second that when we post a message using the bots uh, authentication token, that it says, you know, the Spark bot said the message. So that means if this bot is in uh, multiple rooms uh, the, and you have an application that's doing stuff in there, uh, then it's very clear uh, to all the users in the room that the bot is responsible for those actions and those activities instead of you, right? So if you post your access token into the script and do a bunch of stuff, then it looks like you posted a bunch of these weird messages and all these actions, which can be a little bit confusing. So the good news is that the bot access token essentially never expires. It lasts a really, really long time. It's designed to be uh, configured into applications um, as, you know, as if uh, it's a secure set of credentials. Uh, you need to be very careful, of course, with your bot tokens. Uh, as we'll see, the Spark site only lets you see it once, uh, and then you're supposed to save it in a secure location. Um, <clears throat> bot, accesses, bot accounts have, do have some limited access to messages. Uh, for security reasons. So if a bot is sitting in a chat room and there are messages coming in from various users uh, amongst themselves, uh, the bot uh, has no visibility to those messages. Okay? Um, the only way to send a message to a bot in a group room like that is to mention the bot. 
So if you say, you know, David Stout test bot, you know, here's a command that I want you to execute. That gets sent to the bot. Then the bot can take a resp uh, an action and perhaps respond with, with uh, some information or a file that it posts to the room. So there's a uh, few restrictions on what you can do with a bot token that's different from a regular user. Regular users, of course, uh, can get access to all of the messages in the rooms that they are present in. The <coughs> OAuth access token is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> sort of like the developer access token, um, except it's much shorter lived. It uh, only lasts 14 days, uh, typically, though that can be refreshed using a refresh token. Um, it's intended to be uh, used by what we call integrations. Uh, so these are applications that uh, can directly um, authenticate users with Spark using OAuth and SAML, which we'll see here in a second, and uh, essentially get uh, an access token that represents that user. So those applications can do things on behalf of any user that logs in with the, with the SSO credentials. So that's cool. If I'm using my developer access token, I can really only do things on my behalf. Everything looks like it's being done by me. If I use a bot access token for my application, then everything has to be done by the bot. But if I build an integration application and uh, use the OAuth process to get an access token, I can do things on behalf of any user that can log into my application and gives me the right permissions. And we'll see uh, later that there are uh, some, cr uh, you can control some of the access that these applications have. So let's go take a look at it. <clears throat> how these work in practice, the Wi-Fi functions. There we go. OK, so this is the Spark for Developers website that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> uh, all the documentation and API reference stuff that I uh, talked about earlier is over here. Uh, for example, let's look at the Messages API, and let's look at the Create Message. If you are a Spark user <clears throat> and you've uh, signed up with the service, and it doesn't matter if it's a free account or a paid organizational account, admin account, <clears throat> essentially anyone with Spark credentials can log in here and start using the API. You'll notice that the Spark website <coughs> excuse me, is actually uh, an integration application that we talked about. It uses uh, Spark single sign-on to authenticate me. <clears throat> so this is the Cisco internal <clears throat> single sign-on uh, provider here. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> once you sign in, what you're able to do is uh, click on your avatar over here and actually grab your developer access token. Let me redo that again. If you turn on this test mode, that turns what are uh, static API documentations into an interactive tool that you can use to exercise this API right inside the browser. And if you notice, uh, it's gone and pre-populated a lot of the information that's necessary to make the request, including my particular developer access token, and some things like you know the content type headers, uh, provides some form uh, information here where we can fill out information needed to use the API to post a message into a room. So let's do that. <clears throat> let's post a test message into a test room using my developer token. First thing I'm going to do is go over to my test room, and I'm going to grab the unique ID that belongs to this room. <laughs> I'm going to paste it in here. So that's where we want the message to appear. The only other required field is the text field here. <coughs> 
Excuse me. All right. So it's automatically formed the JSON body of our request. Let's go ahead and scroll down and run it. 200, success. Great, it worked. Let's take a look what happened in the room. Cool. So you can see here uh, that it did, in fact, post a message into the room. <clears throat> Notice that it was uh, the messages for me, David Stout, because we used my developer access token to make that happen. <clears throat> so let's try this using a bot account. On the same developer site, under My Apps, uh, again, anyone with a Spark account, whether free or not, can create bots. It's pretty easy to do. Really, the only thing you have to do is give it a name, um, and the hardest part is choosing an avatar for it. So let's uh, call this the session bot. Notice that this bot is going to have what looks like an email address. It's going to be called dstoutnewbot at sparkbot.io. So every Spark bot <clears throat> will have this at sparkbot.io domain. So that's one way to identify bot accounts. I'm going to grab uh, an avatar URL of this cute little kitten to use to create my bot. And that's it. Now, when you create this bot, it's going to automatically generate uh, an access token for you. Here it is. All right? So we got a nice, long uh, access token that we can use to, to make API requests. So let's copy that to the clipboard. And we'll go back to our <coughs> interactive documentation. And let's look at the authorization header. Instead of using the developer token that belongs to me, I'm going to paste in the access token that we just got for that bot. And let's change the message slightly to indicate we're using a bot token. Hmm, 404, not found. What does that mean? <laughs> well, really the only things we put in there were the text of the message, and there's nothing wrong with that, uh, and the room ID. So I know the room exists. <clears throat> Why didn't it work? The problem is that the bot itself needs to be inside the room. Okay, This is uh, access control. It's built into the way Spark works. So if we go into this room, add in uh, the bot. We can see we added the bot in there. Let's try this again. Success. OK. And if we look back in the client, we can see that, yep, test using the bot token works. And you can see that the user that made the post into this room is attributed to the bot account. So let's look at one more thing. This is uh, a sa little sample application that um, exists on the Spark Depot. So if you go to depot.ciscospark.com, no, Depot. Here we go. Uh, this is a collection of integrations and bots uh, that third-party developers have built. <coughs> that integrate with the Cisco Spark uh, platform. Uh, Cisco Spark is, uh, has a $150 million development fund um, and a lot of outreach like uh, thing, events like this and, and others throughout the country and, in fact, the world uh, to try to encourage developers to build um, you know, integrations and, and extend uh, the capability of the Cisco Spark platform with their own stuff. <clears throat> in this case, let's take a look at the integrations. Um, this page is quadrupled since I looked at it last. Um, but if we go to, for example, the box integration, 
This is an integration uh, which essentially allows you to monitor the activity of a box.com uh, file, <coughs> file hosting account in a Spark room. Right? So if your team uses a box.com folder uh, to keep track of stuff, um, you can get a notification in a particular team Spark room whenever something new happens in there, right? So if somebody updates a document, adds a new document, uh, it's going to be present right in there with a link that you can open it up uh, immediately. So you don't have to copy and paste that into an email and try to keep up with that. So pretty cool. As we'll see, though, it uh, requires us to log in. This is single sign-on here, right? So I'm going to use dstout at cisco.com. And hopefully, <clears throat> it will remember that I've already logged in. It'll use the SSO uh, ticket uh, that the browser maintains, so I don't have to put, type my password in again, uh, or for any, any of the other Spark SSO integrated applications uh, that we'll see here today. <clears throat> when you connect an integration like this, uh, the user is prompted to take a look at the permissions that the application is requesting, just to make sure that those make sense. Uh, so that if you um, don't, if you have users that go to uh, depot.spark.com, uh, you want to make sure that the uh, activities that uh, the application uh, is supposed to be doing are the ones that actually uh, happen. So this is the same as uh, you know on Android or iOS uh, app stores as well. So good, that's it. We're integrated with the box uh, thing as well. Um, Cisco has an SSO integration also with box.com. So I can just use the SSO integration here, and I don't have to log in to box.com to authorize them to hook up the service. Again, I'm going to grant access, make sure they have uh, the right permissions to do what um, I think they're doing. And at this point, the integration application uh, can go and look at all your box folders and files. Uh, you can select, if we scroll down, um, <clears throat> a particular Spark room that you want to post the information uh, to. And then you can select what kind of notifications you want to see. So that's uh, a good example, simple example of a Spark integration using OAuth and single sign-on. So uh, we've talked about it a little bit, but just to reemphasize, you know, what are these different access tokens good for? In what situations do I want to use them? Um, essentially, if you have a server-to-server -server type integration type of application, if you have you know, a cron job that's, that goes out, checks the status of a bunch of servers or file systems or something like that, and you want uh, a report compiled and pushed out to your team, you would probably want to create a bot account grab that access token, put it in the shell script so that uh, you can use curl or whatever to post the, the report right in the Spark room where your team you know, lives and converses and talks and can take action uh, on that notification. OAuth access tokens, you're going to want to use those when you want to do something on behalf of individual users, right? So just like we saw, individual users will log into your application You'll be given a certain restricted set of permissions as to what you can do for them on behalf of them. <clears throat> and typically, you're going to see this uh, kind of access token used, uh, for example, in end user applications, maybe web or mobile apps, um, <clears throat> where, uh, where you build Spark capabilities into browser-based or, or uh, mobile applications, which is definitely a possibility. So if you're not familiar with OAuth 2, SAML 2, and all that good single sign-on stuff, this is a very, very simplified picture. Uh, if you want to go read a couple thousand pages of documentation on the very expansive spec for OAuth 2, you can go there. Uh, but essentially, <clears throat> in addition to the user and the application that they're using, and this could be the Spark client on their mobile phone. Uh, it could be that box.com integration. It could be the developer.cisco.spark.com page where they're doing interactive docs with the API. <clears throat> and Spark is the resource server here. The added piece is uh, this authorization server. 
Now, by default, uh, for free Spark accounts, if you don't belong to any, any uh, defined organization or have a paid account, uh, you're going to authenticate what's called the, uh, the uh, CI, the, the uh, default authentication provider that Cisco uh, uh, makes available to, to the free account users. Uh, so that's great. You can create accounts. Your friends can create accounts for free. Um, but if you want uh, you know, a single sign-on experience, if you want uh, LDAP directory synchronization, right? So you don't have to manually create all your users as they are added and removed from your organization. Uh, you can integrate with LDAP and single sign-on uh, to provide that back-end authentication. So if, if you have Microsoft uh, AD and, or ADFS for single sign-on or something like ping identity, uh, you can essentially really easy, easily hook these up uh, to the Spark platform to authenticate your account. Now, obviously, this is uh, intended for the, the paid accounts. Free accounts don't get those kind of bells and whistles. Uh, but this is the administration page of Cisco Spark. And essentially, all you need to go in uh, and go to the settings section. Look under single sign-on on authentication. Notice it's not enabled. Boom, we want to integrate a third-party single sign-on solution. Let's get started. I won't go through the next steps because I don't have one to hook up. Um, but uh, I think all that has to be done is you download a file from, from Spark, you download a file from your uh, identity provider and kind of exchange them, right? And there's some other configurations after that. The hard part, of course, is getting all that set up. Um, if you're, uh, you know, a network security professional, um, that's your job security. <laughs> um, but once it is working, it's very easy to set up uh, with the Spark system. There we go. So what actually happens <clears throat> when a single sign-on client uh, tries to log into Spark? Um, there's essentially three steps. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, uh, but the main gist of it is that you're going to make an, a web request to this URL right here on the Spark system. That's sort of like the launching point for the OAuth 2 <clears throat> authentication sequence. Now, you have to add on some parameters to that. There's a client. Uh, ID, there's uh, redirect URLs, there's other stuff like that, um, and there's uh, a learning lab that we have available and some sample code that will make it very clear how to uh, create those parameters. Uh, but the application then needs to, to launch a browser, and this is important. The browser opens up, <clears throat> it's going to navigate to this authorized URL plus the parameters that are unique to that application, and the Spark system the third-party uh, authentication system are going to send the user around. They're going to go back and forth. They're going to send a SAML request, et cetera, uh, to eventually bring up the login form that's unique to that back-end system. So it'll look different from the one that I just used. If you're a free account user on Spark, the login looks a little bit different as well. Uh, so the, the browser uh, allows the login um, UI to be different. You may need two-factor two authentication in order to complete the login against particular systems, et cetera. Uh, but it does make it flexible. <clears throat> Once the user has logged in, that browser gets redirected back to your application. Uh, and there's a redirect URL that kind of makes that magic work. <clears throat> Ideally, or you might hope that at this point you're done. You, you can get, grab the access code and get going. But actually, it gives you an interim authorization code. Read the spec to find out why that's important and why that's extra secure. Uh, but uh, you can simply grab that auth code, make an XML HTTP request, so an AJAX request in your browser uh, or your mobile application or, or desktop application. Uh, it's a simple REST API call uh, to turn that authorization code into the actual access token that you need. So essentially, you launch a browser to the special URL. A bunch of magic happens that you don't really know about. At some point, you get an event in your application that the browser is done. You can grab the auth code, trade it in for a real access token, and you're good to go. 
This is a little picture of how it works. <clears throat> Again, the application sends the browser to Spark. Spark and the identity provider do a bunch of magic stuff here so that the user can authorize, right, using their mouse and keyboard or whatever else, using the browser. They authorize the user, say, yep, I want to, I want to give access to this application. <clears throat> the authorization code is sent back to the browser. The application pulls it out of the browser. There's a little magic trick there that's in the sample code that we provide. And then it's a real simple transaction to turn that into the access code. <clears throat> At the very end of all that sequence, this is what you're looking for. Access token, boom, there it is. So this access token represents essentially the user that logged in. It represents also the restricted set of permissions that that user confirmed or affirmed. <clears throat> There's an expiration time. Uh, typically, that's around 14 days for user access tokens. And there's a refresh token that we'll talk about in a second. But once the application has this token right here, it can go ahead and uh, make some requests. So <clears throat> just like we created bots earlier, uh, uh, anybody, any developer uh, with a free account or otherwise can define and create a Spark integration application. Uh, again, there's just a few pieces of information that you need to provide, you know, a name, uh, a cute kitten for the avatar. Uh, the most important thing is uh, the redirect URI and the permissions that you want this application to request from the user. Once you do that, you'll get a client ID and a client secret back that you need to use in the authentication sequence. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's try this out. This is a really tiny sample application uh, that I wrote uh, when for Spark for developers uh, first came out. Kind of encapsulates what a web developer might need to do uh, to get uh, OAuth authentication up and going. Uh, this is uh, actually part of a learning lab <clears throat> that walks you through live, step by step. So you'll actually make an integration. You actually make uh, OAuth requests and API requests. Over there in the Learning Labs area, you can look that up. We're online when you get home. Uh, the sample code for this app is uh, up on GitHub. So free, free, feel free to grab it and uh, paste it into your application. But like I mentioned, anybody can go in under My Apps and create an integration application. So let's do that. Create an integration. DevNet sample app. A lot of this stuff is optional, except the icon. You always got to have an icon URL handy. Scopes. So this is where you get specific. Uh, applications should only uh, request and authorize for the stuff they need to do, right? That's just security best practice. Keep the attack surface low. If your application only does reporting or some sort of analytics, it has no business having permissions to delete rooms or uh, remove users or use admin APIs or anything like that. Uh, so let's keep this simple. We want to do maybe some of the basic messaging stuff, and that's it. Boom. We're done. Except, uh huh. These fields are required now. And the redirect URL is actually the, re the URL of this application here. I got that wrong earlier. Mm -hmm. So the redirect URL is uh, going to be unique to this application. That's why you define it here. Um, every application that's defined on Cisco has a unique endpoint where the results, uh, that, uh, you know, the finalization of, of an OAuth sequence gets sent. Right? So anybody that authenticates with this application, the results get sent here. The user doesn't specify that, right? 
This happens uh, based on the configuration uh, in the integration. So this is, uh, you know, for security reasons, we want to make sure that uh, those access tokens are being sent only to the endpoint that's uh, the correct one. And let's see if it'll let us create it now. Okay, I think it succeeded. Everything looks good, but if we scroll down to the bottom, it's generated some secrets for us. <clears throat> These are two, again, really long, unique identifiers that uh, are unique to this application and integration. It's uh, called a client ID and a client secret. The reason why there's two, the reason why they're named like this is uh, due to the OAuth spec. Uh, I don't know exactly why, but... Um, <clears throat> Essentially, all that we need to do in order to use this sample application is the first step in that sequence that I talked to you about. We're going to send uh, some parameters to the authorization URL. We only need the client ID. We only need the redirect URL and a couple other hard-coded things. But let's request the auth code. Okay. So just like that box.com integration, uh, just like the other ones we looked at, uh, it's going to, this application really only selects uh, the read rooms scope or permission. So that's fine. That seems pretty harmless. I'll accept that. Notice this is a single sign-on. I'm not prompted for my credentials again. This application has no idea what my password is, never sees it, never has a chance to get it. For the second half, <clears throat> when this page is re-requested again, and again, this is the, URI, the redirect URL that we talked about, this is the auth code that I talked about. This is that interim step. This app, web application extracted it from the re return message, and now we are able to make the final trade-in and turn this auth code into an access code. For that, we need both the client ID and the client secret. And that's an OAuth 2 thing. Okay, very quick, very easy. Again, if you look at the uh, sample code for this, and I just erased my token, see? OK, so let's do what we did earlier. Let's test out this access token. <clears throat> now, since I went ahead uh, and uh, logged into this application with my Cisco, doc, uh, you know, dstout at cisco.com authentication credentials, anything that happens with this API token should look like it happens on my behalf. Uh, the access token is different from my developer token. If we post it in there, we can see there's some differences in the the unique ID, and we're going to test using the OAuth token. <clears throat> so I had this problem earlier, and I was scratching my head, and I think I just figured out why. Anybody know why this didn't work? <laughs> Remember those list of permissions that the application requested from us? All it asked for was to be able to read from my rooms, to be able to list my rooms. There was no, no mention in there about posting messages. So when I try to do this message post request, it doesn't work. And this, uh, the interactive docs apparently don't handle that error message very well. So I'm going to be opening up a ticket later on. But kind of shows you how the security mechanisms work uh, in practice there. OK, so that's just about it. Um, 
there are a lot of security controls, a lot of access controls uh, in Spark. Uh, obviously, it's intended uh, so that managers can uh, partition teams, partition information uh, very, very safely. Uh, all the data is encrypted. Um, you can have people working on very secretive projects uh, in one room and one set of teams. You can have people working on, you know, tech support or, or you know, uh, handling tweets in another. Uh, all with, uh, hopefully, uh, very complete safety. Um, as a result, there's a lot of uh, controls as to who can do what. Um, and if you're writing an application, you need to be prepared for this, right? So if uh, you are writing an integration application that free accounts are using, you will probably not expect them to be able to do moderator stuff. So being able to uh, assign someone to lock a room um, in a standard room is only available on, on paid accounts. Uh, so your application needs to be aware of that. If that fails for some reason, then you say, oh, they must be a free user. Organization admins, right? So you can specify people as admins of the organization. Uh, there's a whole bunch of sub-permissions as to what they can do and provision and report on. Some of those admin APIs will work, some won't, depending on the permissions of the particular user. Right? Uh, moderator status. So if you have a bot account, it's in a locked group room, right? Uh, meaning that someone has uh, established at least one moderator in the room. You put a bot in there and start trying to post messages, it's not going to work. Or start trying to add people in there using the bot, it's not going to work. Because only moderators have that right in the room. So it's certainly possible, either manually or through the API, for whoever is uh, an owner or a moderator in that room to make the bot a moderator. So that's definitely possible. Once you do that, bot has full power in there. We talked about this earlier, but bot accounts, again, only receive notifications for messages that they are mentioned in. If you've used Spark at all, you've seen the mention feature. Uh, if you're trying to get a bot to do something, make sure to, to do that so uh, you specifically and very clearly uh, invoke that bot. Um, you don't want people to add you know, little uh, bots into a room that are uh, quietly uh, saving and archiving messages, right? If, if, you're, if you've ever been in a Spark room with a lot of users, hundreds of users, you don't scroll through that list you know, every time you log in to make sure that there's a bot hidden in there. Uh, this is to make sure that uh, only uh, when someone specifically intends to invoke the bot uh, does it get uh, access to any of that privy information. And then we talked about uh, the fine-grained control that integration OAuth scopes can give uh, to limit applications uh, so that the, if they try to post messages in a room that they normally would think uh, they could, uh, it may fail because you didn't give them the scopes or the user didn't authorize those scopes. All right. So if you're interested in uh, developing smart applications, then you are going to be interested in access tokens. You're going to be interested in security, doing this stuff right. Uh, DevNet has uh, quite a bit of information that will help you. As I mentioned, uh, there is a DevNet Learning Lab uh, where that sample app is in there. It'll walk you through step by step how to create an integration, how to use the client secret and code in the sample app. It'll uh, talk you through uh, all the, the JavaScript code that's used to uh, make that work. Uh, that's available uh, either here in the Learning Lab section or online at any time you want to use it uh, at that URL there. <coughs> Spark for Developers has uh, a good, uh, you know, long discussion, uh, easy to understand on authentication and OAuth uh, at their site there. That's probably the first place to start. Um, and then we do have sample code, as I mentioned, that's a complete running web application integration in, I don't know, maybe not even 100 lines of code. So that's available for free as well. The final topic, if I have time for it, I tacked on to the end. I have two minutes. <clears throat> we talked about access tokens uh, coming from OAuth, from integrations. And if you remember, those uh, we said those tokens only last for 14 days. Okay? Uh, I think the idea here is that uh, integration applications that work on behalf of uh, uh, users, they could be on a mobile phone, they could be on a browser that someone uses at a cafe, they could be on a PC that uh, you know, gets used and then recycled and not wiped, something like that. Uh, part of the OAuth spec is that these kinds of tokens uh, should have a, a much lower lifetime uh, than other kinds 
uh, for example, uh, machine accounts uh, and bot accounts. However, if the application is uh, regularly used, when you get the original access token, you also get a refresh token. Very similar. <clears throat> it expires uh, every 90 days. This turns out to be about 90 days. So you can store this, again, securely, right? So you want to hash that. You want to make sure it's encrypted. If you store it in your mobile app or uh, in the browser cache or on a, on a disk, something like that. But uh, there is a special uh, authentication request that you can turn this refresh token into a brand new access token. And then you can start using APIs. Uh, so this is how the Spark application uh, on your mobile device works. It uses this refresh token. As long as you're regularly using Spark, Every time you use this refresh token, it gets bumped out to another 90 days. Right? So I can use this. As long as I'm using this, it works indefinitely. If I you know, throw it in the closet and I give it to my son two years from now because I got a new phone, that token will have expired, and he won't have access to my account because he'll have to re-authenticate. And I think that's it. Any questions? Yes? Uh, so the question is, when you uh, refresh the token to get a new access token, uh, the original refresh token just basically gets extended. Okay, so you can keep the same one. Okay, thank you.